All set? Great. I call to order the special board meeting of Board of Education of Park Ridge Nile School District 64 for June 10th, 2019. Carol, would you call roll, please? Biagi. Here. Little. Here. Pearl. Here. Riles. Here. Zealous. Here. Sanchez. Here. Sotos. Here. Thank you. Um, I don't have any opening remarks. Do you want to do introductions? I don't think there are any introductions no. to do. <laughs> so, okay. Um, yes, Rick, can I just apologize for the last meeting that I was not here? You know, so I just want to apologize to the board members and the administration and the community. Um, I just had a, a family emergency with my dad the afternoon of the last board meeting. And so um, I needed to be at the hospital. And it was not an easy choice because my first meeting and I, <laughs> I missed it. But I don't think this is my track record, so I just wanted to apologize uh, for missing the meeting. No need to apologize. Yeah. Stuff happens. We all, oh, yeah. we all miss meetings. And, for I, a variety I, and of I hope you're not setting a precedent where we all have to apologize yeah, every time we miss a meeting. <laughs> precedent is set, my friend. Well, but thank you. Um, all right, Larry, would you be so kind to lead us in the pledge? <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, sir, it's like me? Yeah, sure. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag. flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, given that there is no public tonight, I assume there's no public comment to discuss, <laughs> so I will pass by that one. Um, and move on to approval of meeting agenda. Are there any additions, deletions, or amendments to the agenda as presented? Can we add a status update discussion on Washington? You beat me to it. Oh, Jake. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. Yes, I would like to do that as well, too. And then I don't know if it's possible during this meeting, but un until the school year starts, could we do just a general enrollment update, too, oh. if possible? I mean, I, I know if no one's ready enrollment to enrollment update. Enrollment, oh, sure. if we could just talk about that at every meeting until the school year starts. Thanks. Yep. Um, all right. So is there any objection to adding the uh, Washington update and the enrollment update? No. From anyone? Okay, then that will be done. We'll just add that to the first thing. Uh, any other additions, deletions, amendments? Okay, then Luann, can you give us an update sure. on Washington uh, Space Committee and maybe at the same time we can talk about enrollment because that kind of goes hand sure. in hand. Uh, so Washington Space Committee, we're having our next meeting on Tuesday the 18th. So if um, I can interject, the, we just found out that date today in my office. So that date is being pushed out. We um, notified members today via email, the 18th. Right. the 18th. And we're adding three new teachers because four teachers, three or four teachers stepped off the committee and said, no, thank you. And three new ones, uh, Stephanie was able to find three new ones to join the committee. So they were communicated with today. Yep. Uh, yep. And that date was selected because, first and foremost, because the architect, Rick Patricek, was available on that date. I have two questions. One, did the, uh, did the teachers who step off give a reason for stepping off? And two, have any uh, other parent uh, community members in that area requested to be on the committee since our first go around? I'll take the latter first. Uh, okay. To my knowledge, no uh, parents, no additional parents have asked to participate in the committee. Um, I, I think that there was a, a level of maybe concern by some of the teachers. Uh, we had a number of meetings. The board meeting was lengthy. It was a little intense at times. Ultimately, their recommendation was really not oh, taken into consideration, system. and we swapped so okay. the decision making. We didn't honor the consensus right, they're just um, that, that they reached. They came Hopefully here willing to, to, be to be flexible, teacher. and um, we how didn't, did something different with the space. How, how didn't we uh, reach that? I, I believe their recommendation was TAs, which we, yes. Not, not with first grade. No, with first that first grade was the one that they I mean, for better or worse. No, but during our discussions, though, we, we said, hey, maybe we can, no, we said, hey, maybe we can, uh, that was my, my uh, I, I, I was the one that, that said that if we can do it under scenario A with TAs, why can't we do it under scenario right. C? And they all agreed, though. They but didn't, they didn't, they didn't object. They actually, they actually paused, we paused the discussion and they came back after 
during our conversations and said, you know, we've had a chance to discuss this, and yes, we can alter that to A. So they actually came back with the, yes, we can do it that way. I think that's true. I, again, not, I don't know anything more. You may know more than I do, but my suspicion is that they didn't have buy-in from the rank and file at Washington. So special classroom versus. Right, because that, that deal to go TA for first grade was what allowed us not to use that SPED classroom. Mm -hmm. And my suspicion is they made a deal on the fly with the board and the community that night. I, it was all out in the open, it was in the public, but I suspect they may have taken heat from the rank and file back in Washington for that. I'm speculating. So we have a few additional teacher members. Um, some were unavailable also, knowing that the committee was gonna continue into the summer. A portion of that was they, they were not available um, you know, to come in and meet over the summer. You know, and, the school year. and the hope is, I mean, I don't know, Luann, tell me if I'm off base here, but I would hope we wouldn't have to meet more than twice. I mean, I'm kind of hoping one well, I'm, I'm hoping the one this next meeting we yeah, will be able to bring back a resolution right. to the board. Because really what we're focusing on for this is solely the bigger picture. The mm -hmm. what are we going to do for space going right. forward. We've already addressed the other stuff mm -hmm. for this year. We've already addressed the multi-purpose room. Now it's really just what do we do for classroom space. So well, and we are. Solution, and we are looking at both. Well, it seems so loud yeah, in here. Work. Seems loud. Um, so we're looking. Yeah, it's like weird. We're looking at both the discussion about the gym or multi-purpose room addition. However, we are relooking at the addition of the classrooms. Right. Um, you know, based on costs of different things, what's the best bang for our buck? So, so not to tell tales out of school, but that's. It, it sounds like there's a very viable solution to do classrooms that would be either less than or the same price as doing the gym. And at the end of the day, we need more cla we need classrooms, we don't need a gym. So the audit so. auditorium would then proceed, if that's how we choose, to become a <coughs> multi-purpose room, sport court floor, um, lunchroom tables built in. Um, it wouldn't be identical to field because the stage would have to be handled differently, but same type of theory that we would use for so that from, space. from now until the next meeting if uh, when you're talking to the architects I uh, had done a little bit of my own like <coughs> research and searching there there are multi-purpose room multi-purpose room options mm -hmm. that can be built in a way where they they can convert to four cl full classrooms you, you basically you're partitioning them in quadrants mm -hmm. and they act they actually can be four classrooms full functioning, equal to any other classroom in the school with all the same feel and functionality, but have the flexibility of converting to a multi-purpose or other use room. And the reason I bring this up is because I firmly believe that whatever we build in any of our schools should have the flexibility of, yes, solving, yes. of solving multiple problems as our problems change over the years. Correct. Today we have the problem of classroom space. Tomorrow we may have the, the problem of no, the classroom space might be okay, but we might have a situation where we need more multi-purpose room, or if we don't need the classrooms, we can then utilize it as something else. Mm -hmm. We can do more fine arts stuff. We can uh, rent it out and maybe earn some money to Park District or other programs when, when we find ourselves in an up and mm -hmm. down situation, which I've noticed over the years here in Park Ridge seems to be the trend. It's pretty typical. We go up, we go down. We go up, we go down. Now, I know that Washington, it, you know, the, the theme is we are dead of space anyway. But I, I feel if we can solve the space issue by creating classrooms in a, in a space that can, can be easily converted uh, out into something other mm -hmm. than classrooms it gives a lot more flexibility. And I believe that would be a good plan moving forward for all our schools uh, situate uh, all our schools issues you know Franklin tomorrow is going to need the same thing boom you have the you have the answer we're not spending years and months and days designing it we already have the design we boom you figure you fit, figure out how it fits and we move on mm -hmm. so if we can see if there's something like that yeah I'll work. talk to uh, Rick the only problem you have when you're not using permanent walls is noise well uh, so the, the the research that I did the, these these walls that are not permanent are equally, if not more soundproof than regular walls because they are fully insulated. They are, they, you know, if you, even the walls in our gyms, even the walls in our gyms are pretty, pretty soundproof. 
You can be on one side in Emerson, you know, shooting around, and there could be a full game going on next door. And if that wall is completely closed and the doors on that wall are completely closed, it is pretty loud on the one side and you can barely hear it on the other. And there are better walls than the ones that we currently have that, you know, are on tracks that can be equally as soundproof as, uh, I mean, if we're really talking about a, a classroom wall, guys, we're talking about two five pieces of five-eighths drywall and some insulation. A movable wall can be built it, with the same exact soundproofing as mm -hmm. a non-movable wall. Okay, well, let's see what we yeah, to come back to. If you want to share where you did that research, okay. that would be great too. It's confidential. Sorry. It's confidential. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of the update on Washington School right now. Uh, more to come, obviously, at our next meeting. We'll have a recommendation, hopefully, from our committee to bring forward to the board. On the enrollment, um, as of, I think this was as of this morning, we have 2,597 K-5 students registered, and we have 365 students uh, pending. So that would be a total of 2,962 K-5 students which is the equivalent of 120.5 sections. Isn't that interesting? So Washington School, uh, right now, we are looking okay at uh, first grade is totally fine. So we're like, that's not gonna go over unless we have some big influx. Kindergarten, we have 13 pending right now. We have 75 registered. So we're potentially going to have a half, another half section of kindergarten. And that was that we would bring channels of challenge downstairs to split that classroom with them and then what's in that room would move. I think it's a fourth grade would move. Or I can't remember what it was. Something would move upstairs. So what was our number for? So 88, we're at 88 right now. 89 <coughs> splits it. Fine, complete. 89 is our um, Correct. Our so that's where you would put an eight in the classroom or split to another for, section. For which class? For kindergarten? Kindergarten. Okay. First grade is, is fine. Um, fifth, fourth grade, we are two students away. Which we're, so we're holding. So we've stayed the same since the last Pretty time. Pretty much on right. that. So we're still holding right now on that one. So when you split kindergarten, how do you juggle it between morning and afternoon? So it would be, they would do, well, first of all, if we were to put another section in, it would be uh, two classrooms would have two mornings and two afternoons and then one classroom would probably more than likely have a morning Would be my guess and then in the afternoon channels of challenge. Sorry channels of challenge would use that space uh, For their classes, so they would have to do their schedule so that would work Stephanie will take a look at what how the parents request because they, they request a morning or an afternoon preference She'll also look based on how we're going to share space with Channels of Challenge when she's programming for ELA and math. And that may determine whether it'll be a morning section or an afternoon section. Okay. If it pops. Okay. Uh, at middle school, we have uh, 1,283 students registered with 301 pending uh, for a total of 1,584 children or 60 sections. Uh, the numbers at both middle schools, nothing to worry about. I'm watching one at Emerson. We may actually go down a section. I think it's at seventh grade. Uh, so we'll see how that materializes. It's always more difficult getting middle school parents to register their students. I don't care what district it is. Okay. So Washington, we were discussing the potential of a bubble pop in kindergarten the potential of a bubble pop in first grade. Correct. And the potential of a bubble pop in fourth grade. Correct. Three she updated you on, yes. Right, I and as of, um, as of right now, kindergarten has popped. No. Nope. We're, no. we're one student. One student away from mm -hmm. it popping. And we're two students away from fourth grade popping. Correct. And we feel pretty confident that first grade will not pop. That is correct. Okay. So if in that scenario, this is just a recap for the community, in that scenario, if both kindergarten and fourth grade would pop, they would both get TAs in the scenario that was, uh, that was kind of loosely approved by the uh, committee uh, that we discussed last week. My understanding is that fourth grade would get a TA and we have a space for the extra section of kindergarten. So we would be split. dealing... And then the only question I guess I needed clarification on is what would, how, how would the class, the fourth grade classrooms be split up? Would each classroom get the equal amount of students and there would be a TA in each classroom or would one classroom 
have only that one extra student that caused the bubble to pop and that classroom would have a TA? Or would we probably put five or six students into that classroom with a no. TA? No. So, so, that the, so that everyone is, is clear, if, if we go from three sections to four, or would it be four to five? It would be grade. five to six. Five to six. So if we go from five to six, we would have t how many children in each class? 26? And I guess, Tom, can we see if the enrollment bubble pops? I mean, I feel like no, I, I, get I, it. I watched the video in, mm -hmm. from the last meeting, and it's different watching it than being here, just saying. And so I just want to, it is, I think there was just a lot of time discussed on this. And so now we're going, and the bubble may not even pop mm -hmm. because exactly. students entering in fourth grade exactly. is an anomaly. My daughter entered in fourth grade. She was the only student entering field in fourth grade. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't happen. So I feel like, let's see, and Luann has agreed to do an enrollment update every meeting. Mm -hmm. let's, let's see what happens because it might be a mute point and I'd rather let's spend our time doing appreciate. something more productive. I appreciate, I, I appreciate your comment, but I would like to complete my, my thought. And the reason for it is, is I sat on this board when there was a situation where an anomaly did happen and something popped and it happened really late. And the community went very, very, had a very difficult time accepting what happened. And I, I'm just trying to avoid that from happening again. So with this update, I just want to make it clear because some people have been confused by our last meeting. They didn't really understand. So the questions I'm asking are actually uh, in response to some of the feedback I've received from our last meeting of a little bit of confusion in the public. So uh, I'm trying to get a little clarification for myself as well. I, I will say also that one of the things that we committed to a year or two ago when the triplets were enrolled, we had triplets enrolled the night before school started, mm -hmm. which you know caused us to have to, on that first day of school, create a new classroom. We had you know kids in a temporary mm -hmm. space in the LRC. Um, we at that time, uh, agreed to communicate with parents about the plan should anything burst and the principals have been doing that they've been sending out updates to the families okay. you know we don't assume that many folks are watching the video and certainly even fewer are in the audience so we uh, the, the principals have been communicating with parents of those bubble sections so just so you know and we can continue your thought on, on camera here but the principals are communicating to keep the parents you know, a price of what's happening, so they know if they should be nervous about splits or not. Okay, it's, been, it's had a positive. Good. I'm effect. glad to hear that. Absolutely. So just so, so just I'm to clear. Wrap it up. Um, there are no other bubbles you're watching in any other grammar schools, correct? There, sure. there was one at Carpenter. I didn't get my computer. Okay, <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. So there would be twenty. There, there would be twenty-six in each classroom, except one would have twenty-seven, and that correct. Would get the TA. Correct. Okay, and that is the recommendation. That is the the best uh, best practice. Best practice. On, on, on how to handle that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Good. Been done. Any other questions? Uh, so Carpenter had one at kindergarten. We're not seeing the students materialize and field at second, and we are fine there also. And then Roosevelt at fourth. So none, I mean, none of those are close right okay. now. So we're looking we've been okay. So focused on Washington, I just wanted to make sure we didn't move oh, yeah. on another school. That and if we have some huge change, well, we'll be talking about Washington. We can let you guys know too if there's Great. a big change between now and the next meeting. Can I ask just a really quick Washington question? That's, are, do we vote at the next meeting? Potentially. Okay. For Washington. Depending on yeah. what we, our yeah. meeting is the 18th or the 19th. What day did we just say the 19th? 18th. 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 Possibly. It, our meeting okay. is what, the 24th? Yeah, we may yeah, have to schedule a have special have meeting. We have to schedule, yeah. The hope would be, July. I mean, if I have my way, I would like to see the committee come out with a recommendation on the 18th that, that they could right, bring right. to the board and say, here we go. But that may, we just don't know what's going to happen. Depending on what we yeah. propose and if they can turn it around. Yep. Right. Sometimes what we do is we'll have you reach consensus on a concept. Right. Then the architects can go forward and kind of get the ball rolling. Okay, that's what we need yeah. to put together. And then we may have to schedule a very quick But um, even if, I mean, based July. on what Rick has said, yep. Even if we didn't get it in the June meeting, if we got it in the July meeting, we should still oh, yeah, we're okay. generally be okay to, for okay. them to meet time frames for next school year. So okay. hopefully we can get it done quicker, but if we can't, we've got a little... Well, we're still good for that deadline. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sort of definitely. Yeah. Okay. Yes. okay. I don't want to push it past July, yeah. that July meeting. Okay. Yeah. Rick, seeing, as, seeing as we have an answer for field right now and, and seeing as, as when we made our decision on field, would you be willing to re 
visit with our architects if they would feel comfortable expanding the or uh, giving us a, a, a de expanding the deadline. Because I mean, I still I still don't understand how July is our deadline when we decided on the field. The top of your I think your mic is off. It is. So this is more than likely going to be a much bigger addition. Um, than the field multi-purpose room just because of where it'll need to go on the building potentially and do we want to look at a, a larger space um, if we look at an addition to the building obviously that is going to be additional footprint um, so we have worked with the city obviously we got field through um, but we'll be going back with Washington so then we have to look at all the detention issues um, you know where the building's located and, and everything like that. And, um, and we, let's talk to them at the committee meeting. Yeah, I'm just really, there. I'm really uncomfortable making such a large, large decision okay. after one committee meeting and one more board meeting to spend millions of dollars on a permanent fix for Washington. I, I, I feel like it's, it's a super. I feel like it's a super rush. I mean, I really do. I, and I don't want to get this wrong. So I'm just asking. Yep. Let's, let's push them on that. And, and again, let's see what they come back with. They may have some right. really different plans. Right. I mean, to do the detention, I think it <coughs> took us about three months just to yeah. come into agreement with MWRD and the city. It, it's a long, that's a long process. Um, right. well, but yeah. let's, let's see what happens. In right. And, and we'll go from there. And why has been able to push them on other stuff. So <laughs> yeah, we're not starting the construction until, you know, late in the well, year anyway. So I mean, right. It's, right. They would be looking probably to start either this fall or in March, right. I think. Okay, any other questions on Washington update or, or enrollment? Okay, then we are moving on to the big ticket item for tonight. Ooh, the budget. Okay, the so budget. Uh, let me get, is that changing? I may need to have walk over there instead. Do you want me to work the and, thing? Hey, Larry. Can you move your mic a little bit closer? I was getting uh, the high sign from the audience that uh, your mic was a little far away. There Did it go. go? Okay. Do you want me to work the clicker? Oh boy, you can't see it. We knew that light blue was light. Okay, do you guys all have it on your screen? Yeah, we have it. Yep. It's, it's pretty, but it's... Anyone in the <laughs> audience, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, Hard to read. We'll, we do have it posted online. It's okay. The board packet. Uh, I didn't know it was gonna be like that. Okay, so tonight we're talking about the 2019 20 uh, budget. It's hard to believe we're here again, but uh, this is typical time of year when we start working on it. So since we have some new board members, I thought I would kind of go through the budget cycle with you guys so that you understand how this, this works uh, going forward. So starting in January and February, we review our financial projections because we find out the CPI, which is released uh, mid-January, so then we know what our CPI for the tax levy going forward will be. Uh, we start reviewing with the board generally in February our enrollment and staffing plans based on our projections for the enrollment and then other needs. So if there are needs for additional special ed teachers or uh, psychologists or something, we generally will start talking to the board about that and telling you what the cost is going to be associated with that. At the January board meeting, you actually give us authority um, you vote on it to begin our budget cycle. So it's just um, kind of something you do every year just to allow us to work on it. Our February, March, April, May time frame, the board approves our staffing generally in March. Uh, we have meetings with our different departments, our large departments, our curriculum and instruction, our special ed, our technology, our operations and maintenance, human resource, you know, big ticket items in our budget. Uh, with them. They all have uh, budgets. We have it prepared in Google Docs so we can all share it. And I, I really have to say kudos to the administrators that are putting this together and the tech um, instructional, t no, not instructional, the um, curriculum individuals, Specialist. specialists that are working with Lori on putting all their budgets together. It's, it is a quite detailed budget pretty much down to, you know, this amount for this item. Uh, we receive in April our rate increases for our benefits and district insurance, which is the second largest part of our budget behind salaries. No one can see it but us, me anyways. <laughs> uh, in June, then we have this committee of the whole where we review the tentative budget. 
with the board. And what I asked uh, Rick and Lori tonight is if we could split it since uh, we have so many new board members and uh, I mean, it is a large budget. I mean, when, at the end of the day, when you add in construction, we're probably very close to a hundred million dollar budget. It's a big budget. Um, so we will set next time, uh, we will set the date for the budget hearing. So there'll be a resolution that we'll ask you to adopt and we'll place that budget on display 30 days prior. So we actually put it on as soon as you guys set the hearing next time at the tw on the 24th, then it's on display under the business office online or if somebody wanted to come in, we would have a hard copy for them to review. Then in August, we'll conduct a public hearing on our budget. Uh, the board has asked that we try to always have a hearing the month prior to asking the board to adopt the tax levy, budget, those type of items. Uh, the board will adopt the budget prior to September 30th. That's in statute that we do that. And then we submit it to the county clerk's office and all the appropriate uh, government agencies. Then in October, the board reviews our tentative tax levy and we set a date for the public hearing for our tax levy. We also at that same time review financial projections proposed on that tax levy. I forgot to mention we'll also look at financial projections based on this budget. So before you make any decisions on major expenditures, we show you the financial projections that are, because it's something material that will have an impact. November, we conduct our public hearing on our tax levy and then in December, the board approves the tax levy and this by statute has to be done prior to the last Tuesday of the month, um, submitted to Cook County. I mean, it's all very, very legal about the dates and the times that we have to hit with these. So that's our budget cycle and then January, we start all over again. Are we changing? Okay. So within a school district budget, we have, we do fund accounting. So it's different than accounting uh, for a private uh, company or corporation. So we have ours broken out to our major funds, fund 10 being our educational fund. That's instructional related items. It's also called the general fund. So if we have like couldn't figure out anywhere else to charge something, it's charged to the general fund. So to fund 10. But for our purposes, it's pretty much all of our instructional expenditures are charged there. Fund 20, operations and maintenance is our upkeep of our buildings and grounds. It's also where we charge our security uh, expenditures because many of those are material in uh, nature. So that uh, pretty much includes all operations and maintenance within our district. Uh, fund 30 is our debt service and that's solely established to pay debt payments. When the district issues bonds, the county clerk sets those tax levies every year uh, and that is paid out of there. We also pay, uh, we have some capital leases and our debt certificate payments, which are levied in other, they receive the money from a levy in another fund, so O&M, the levy for the debt certificates, we take the money from there. So that's all moved to debt service and paid out of there. Fund 40 is our transportation fund. So this is pretty much just our costs associated with busing students. Uh, it's regular transportation, special education transportation, uh, Title I homeless transportation, and smaller budgets in there for band, uh, orchestra, uh, band chorus, interscholastic sports. So our field trips are pretty much done at the activity level. So that money um, we, is not really recorded within our expenditures. It pretty much happens through a liability that we're paying the bill and then being repaid by the activity account, which is very typical in a school district. Fund 50 is our municipal retirement fund, Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund. So this is all non-certified employees that work over 600 hours in a 12-month period. Uh, we pay IMRF. Uh, for all of those employees. Fund 51 is FICA, Social Security and Medicare. We pay Social Security on all IMRF employees and non-certified even if they're not IMRF. Uh, for our certified staff, it's Medicare only. So um, unless they've worked in a position prior to becoming a teacher, uh, they will not receive Social Security. 
Fund 60 and 61 are capital projects, so those are non-recurring projects. Those are the big construction projects. We establish a different fund every time there's a different bond issue, so it's easy for us to track our expenditures if we were audited. Fund 70 is basically our savings account. That's our working cash account. We have a small uh, tax levy that goes into there, a little under $600,000 a year. We've used uh, the funds uh, in my tenure so far, 10 million of that for construction, and we will be asking the board at the next meeting to authorize $11 million transfer out of working cash uh, into capital projects to fund this summer's projects and what would be the start of the next year. So when we pay the architect fee, we pay basically 75% of that fee is paid before we even start construction. Uh, so that a lot of those expenditures occur before summer even gets here. Fund 80 is our tort immunity fund. This is our liability insurance. This is also where we pay workman's comp, or if we have someone claim unemployment, all of this is paid out of the fund. Uh, it's a fund that we're very careful with, as should all districts. Um, we don't want tax objections, and so we only levy, I really try to levy only the money for the expenditures we need and not have too much of a fund balance within that fund. The only funds we, uh, just so you know, the only funds we can transfer, well maybe it's easier to say the ones we can't transfer. Debt service we can't transfer, municipal retirement, social security, Medicare, uh, none of those, or tort immunity funds cannot be levied in there and transferred to another fund. So let's, uh, this week we'll be looking at our education fund, our debt service fund, transportation fund, and our tort immunity fund. And next week we'll be looking at our uh, revenue accounts. I did receive um, late Friday afternoon our final tax levy for this year. So I'll be incorporating that into uh, the revenue. I mean, it was good news, not bad news. Um, and then we'll be showing you the operations and maintenance, IMRF construction funds, and working cash funds at our next meeting, okay? So I just kind of want to run over this quickly because it's gonna change when we implement infinite visions. But when you look at our reports, please always ask me if you have questions or don't understand something. But as you can see, our account structures are very long. They include our locations, so all of our schools, and we have a district-wide account, and we have actually one for ESC that we use. Can you do that? Sure. I'll just go, Vanna. <laughs> okay, Vanna. Uh, then we have functions. So function is what are we do? You know, what are we doing? It's instruction, support services, all the way through debt service payments. These are all set by the state. So this is through the Illinois Program Accounting Manual that uh, this is done. Our objects, you can see, are basically your salaries, benefits, uh, supplies. So when we're looking at our budgets, we actually, you know, when, when I'm looking at it, we're chopping it different ways. Sometimes it's by object, just by salary. Some of the information we'll report to you will be by object and not necessarily by function if we're looking at how much we're spending in different areas. Uh, we then have, um, we have, so we have fund location, function, object, program, and then project is our last six digits. So for all of our uh, title grants, they all have a code which is associated with the state code so we can track our revenue and expenditures. Uh, for our construction every year, I set up, we set up a new string of accounts for that program code so it's based on the year, so 2019, and then it's project one through you know, 12 or whatever it is for that year, so we easily, know that we've kept all the expenditures for that project, so it helps when we do our audit and when we do our fixed assets. It's very easy to see what we spent in the different areas. Okay, the review of the tentative budget. So the largest uh, expenditure in, in, in our budget is our salaries. So over 80% is salaries. Uh, this year, as we reported earlier, the average salary increase, this is just average for PREA is 3.38. What I did is I take the cohort of individuals at that point in time that are returning and look at what their average raise would be. For PRTAA this year, it's about 3.09%. 
Our exempt staff is the average of the two uh, for the part that is blended, 3.24. Our um, custodial and secretaries, 3.1. And then admin, as we had discussed, uh, we used a 3% um, average raise for Lori for determining what her budget was. If you guys have any questions, just say, just I yell it out. I have a question. I don't know if this is the right time, though. Um, so you mentioned Google Docs. That's when um, info is input in there. And I also read some reference to like uh, some type of online access. Is that the same thing you're talking about? Is when is, or is there some other type of online access that people have when they're um, configuring these expenditures? So you have Google Docs, right, mm -hmm. with the um, working mm -hmm. um, budget, and then. Is there so that is the online access that would have been referred for to. those okay. different departments? And then yes. afterwards, it's input into the actual software, so it's like a to infinite visions. Okay. Yes. So I'm like a really anal budgeter. So she just likes uh, <laughs> not Google Docs. <laughs> right. Yeah. But so I use Excel a lot. Can work collaboratively yeah. on the budget without you know sitting in the same room. Right. As her. right, right. They have access to it collaboratively. Then after they've met by department with Luann and kind of finalize what their initiatives are and the price points attached to mm -hmm. them. Then once that process is taken care of, then her, someone in her department puts that information into what will now be infinite uh, mm -hmm. vision. And that's a straight upload. Yeah. Building. And then who has access to infinite visions? Just your whole department or people outside of you? Who has department? access to right. infinite so visions? Who's using infinite visions? So we have itself. core users. So those okay. are individuals that do payroll, accounts payable. Um, individuals in the HR department, so like Joel obviously has access and myself, so it's used for hiring. Um, so it's really all of our finance and human resources. So we have, you know, direct obviously access to the whole program. All of our employees have access, um, de depending on who they are, they have a dashboard. So employees can see all of their pay records, change their W-2s, change their contact, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then we have individuals like principals that have a different level and they go in and approve expenditures and can see their budget. Um, I've really worked since I came here to have them really have their budget um, and given totally. them autonomy, uh, which they didn't have before and they should have. I shouldn't be deciding how they spend their budget. Right. And then I think one thing that would be helpful for me at least would be um, in, in these budgets, if, if there is space, if you could add a couple of prior years. So we have the 2018-19, and then we have the tentative 2019-20. And if it is easier in the software to just add a couple of prior years, that might be helpful, or at least to me it would be. Well, so what we, what we do this time of year is we give you the budget, and then when we bring it back, um, I don't know that we'll, no, we have to wait till the end of the fiscal year. Then you'll see all of the prior year expenditures yeah. in there. Um, that's how we typically have mm -hmm. always done that. So this time you're seeing this budget and you're seeing the prior year budget, then you'll when see the expenditures yeah. and we'll show comparisons to the prior year. Is that when year. you do the budget to actual? Yes, yes, so yes. So it's a process of the budget yeah. to actual. So then you'll be able to see the look back and how, how we're spending, what our trends are. are right, we okay. Are we up, are we Sometimes. down, are we pretty consistent? Mm -hmm. And right, I just didn't want to create too much extra yeah. work for anyone either. So the other thing I just wanted to mention in the budget where there's the beautiful baby blue numbers, those are ones that are not, we're still working on those numbers. So you can see there's still a great deal of work going on on a lot of these numbers. So as we had discussed at our staffing meeting, this was from the March meeting when you approved it, we have placeholders for new staff for 2019-20. Um, which we had talked with the board about and have been put in the budget, our assistive technology specialist, uh, intervention coach, uh, which would be the Wilson mm -hmm. trainer, uh, two additional resource uh, positions, and in another instructional SPED teacher, two additional speech, these are additional speech and language, 2.5 for the ELA differentiation coaches, and then right now I have three teachers in there uh, for potential increased enrollment. And as we get closer, obviously, I start removing those uh, if it really looks like we're not going to need them. Uh, the other thing that happens with the salaries is that we, when we do this, I mean, I'm replacing people. So Joel's telling me who's replacing who. So we have a apples to apples comparison or when we fill those positions. So we try to keep, I mean, our, our salary budgets are the real salaries. So like right now, there's two placeholders in there for speech language, and that's because they haven't been approved by the board yet. So. And then one of the things through collective bargaining a few years ago, 
you know, the board had directed us when, especially when teachers retire and they're making, you know, $115,000, $118,000 because they've maxed out in terms of our, our, um, our collective bargaining agreement on the salary schedule. The directive from the board was to try to bring people in around fifty-four, fifty-five thousand. So that's typically very close to a starting salary with no experience, maybe a year. So when we hire folks, especially in the classroom ranks, we try to stick within that step one, two, PA year one, two, type on. 65, 50, 55 to sixty thousand dollars, and then that money, the money that we're saving by um, through attrition and then hiring um, newer folks, we're pumping that money in. Uh, to the facility projects and we let the teachers union know that if they worked with us through this first round of uh, the first four years of the collective bargaining agreement that that's what we would be doing with the additional funds we were saving and it, it has really helped mm -hmm. us save millions of dollars that we can put towards that we've facility put in work. through our debt yep. certificates that money's coming into construction a couple other things on salary and I know my Larry over here is chomping at the bit is it does the word start with an s have to do with stipends does it end with a d <laughs> that is the Coolest word in the English language. <laughs> We're almost there, Larry. And overtime. If it's hooked there. to your name, right? <laughs> so That's let's just talk about that. I gave you two documents tonight while we're talking about salaries. This was um, a request that I received. So the, the first document, this one, the two-page one, is straight out of our PREA contract. Straight so at our last negotiations, we are our committee for stipends worked many, many hours to uh, quantify and put this together. So before our list was like, there was a lot, a lot of stipends, but there was only maybe 10 mentioned in the contract. So we've really tried to uh, tease it out and really identify everything because for me to try and budget and not know about stipends would be insane. So I, I mean, I couldn't budget because as you can see, when you look at my other sheet, which is extra pay, stipends, hourly, and overtime, and I wrote some notes on there for you guys. For stipends, we pay right over a million dollars. So I mean, I need to, you know, we need to know what that is for budgeting. So we've pretty much quantified all of it uh, in the PREA uh, contract. Uh, we did our per diem days, which are days that are used for uh, curriculum writing. So that's used by our curriculum specialists in the summer. Uh, some use all their days, some don't use all of them, um, but they receive the curriculum writing rate, which is about $47 an hour. Uh, we have some total hourly in there, which are, are typically budgets that we're, we are more than likely going to see spent on hourly. And then overtime, most of our overtime is clerical, so we don't have uh, teachers or administrators receiving uh, overtime. We all work on a salaried contract. So the ones that we see receiving overtime are per Fair Labor Standards uh, Board for who should be receiving uh, overtime. So that's um, anyone in the secretarial and custodian union would be eligible for overtime. Larry. Yeah, so I always ask for this information because I always want to look at stipends and overtime to see if there's value added to our children's education by paying overtime and stipends. And there, you know, I always have a uh, painful look on my face when I see $284,000 paid to stipend teachers for lunchroom supervision. And it, this is something four years ago we didn't pay. It wasn't there. Well, the so, parents were paying it. Right. Because okay. when kids, this, because kids would pay if they stayed through the lunch hour. Mm -hmm. And we got rid of that a number of years ago. More than four. Yeah. And I can tell you why we got rid of it, because Bernadette's been cleaning out her files. <laughs> we got because rid of it. <laughs> Bernadette. I, Bernadette's been cleaning out her files. Oh, by bringing them to Luann. By bringing them to my office. So, so, now, so now we know why we got rid of it, which is? And Lori brings her files. So. Only construction. <laughs> Only construction. The reason they got rid of it was because DCFS came in and said that if we were running this, quote, daycare, we had, they had to be providing the lunch also. So that's why they did away with this private non-for-profit company, which had its own board of directors and everything, and brought it into the district was... Uh, they could DCFS would not let them continue to operate in the manner they were operating under. 
So since that time, we've had a combination of teachers and teacher assistants running the lunchroom at the different schools. And teacher assistants, that is part of their um, Assign. daily assignment, so they're not receiving uh, stipends. We did that in our last contract negotiation, so before and after bus duty and lunch duty are part of their normal work day. In the teacher's collective bargaining agreement, however, they get a duty-free lunch via the contract. So if they choose to work during the lunch hour, they have to be paid for it. So that's, and then there's the, that dollar price tag that Larry speaks to every time we do the budget. So yep. the um, non-certified, I just want to make clear, non-certified, that that's part of their day. They do also have a duty-free lunch. So just so I'm clear, though, what the number is. So we're on page, and actually I wanted to ask the question, are these on the, I know these weren't part of our board pack. This I, this we will way. get this on the website. Is I it? just worked on okay. this today. <clears throat> today, But this is in the, the PREA agreement, but we right. can put it with this for today's board yeah. meeting just so it's helpful. easily accessible. So on page whatever two of, of this piece, mm -hmm. it breaks out lunchroom supervision, $331,300, non-teacher, two eighty four one teacher. So the non-teacher is... It's lunchroom supervisors, that that's the only system. duty they do here in the district. Right. So, so the non -TAs, TAs and the, and the teachers are all under the... The teachers, TAs are not paid. Number. So uh, maybe I'm stealing your thunder here, Larry, but um, just ballpark. What's the number of people? Ballpark. Oh, I mean, God. Because it's my understanding, at if, for instance, at if, X school, at the most. there might be 10 lunchroom yes, helpers and one teacher. So they do have a, they have an allocation of one supervisor per 30 students. Right. And so what the, the um, principals try very, very hard to have teachers sign up because students behave better if there's a teacher in the room. Uh, lunchroom supervision, some buildings have no problems getting individuals as lunchroom supervisors. Other buildings struggle. Or we have buildings where the teachers really don't want to do the lunch duty, so then we're trying to hire lunch supervisors, you know, pretty much for all the positions within. But we can get you numbers. Well, what I'm all I'm really trying to establish here is what's actually in the document already, right. which is that the teachers and the TAs are being paid. Uh, 284. Thir 35 bucks an hour, 24 bucks an hour, right? That's on the stipend. And it comes out to about $30 an right. hour, and an average, you average. Know, the lunch ladies are getting 10 to $12 right. an hour. Right, and the non-teachers are getting 10 to $12 an hour. Mm -hmm. I'm on the Third. second page of the collective bargaining agreement matrix. Oh, I see that. Towards the top. <coughs> yeah. And the point I made la last year when we discussed this is, of course, we could yeah, hire. More lunchroom yeah, we right. could hire three times as many lunchroom right. ladies. Uh, you know, as it, one teacher. Yeah, absolutely. The reality and, and of your it. point was we couldn't hire. Correct. Them. I, I was going to say. Put a sign out in front of we have. and we did that. <laughs> check that box and check, check, check every right. year. Um, but we do struggle, and and you know the principals will tell you, they're at some of the schools they go without as many lunchroom supervisors as they would like all year long. Yes. Because it, for, you know, it's not that glamorous of a job. Um, and it's only right in the middle of your day. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's a hard position to fill for, you know, 10 or 12 bucks an hour. Seems like we have this conversation we do. every year. We do. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on salaries? Yeah, one more. Yes, sir. Just don't oh, run. Um, <laughs> we're paying a nurse to work beyond the bell, paid by the district. Why isn't the park district paying that salary? Oh, so they, they are paying for it um, through a rental fee that we receive. Um, this goes back to the Department of remember the Justice, remember all the that. Remember the DOJ? Substantive yeah, sure. support? So they do pay for it. Because initially we weren't doing that because it was not our program. They were using our space, but it's a park district program. Right. Parents pushed that, went to the DOJ level, saying that because the park district is such a partner at a level, that they, we give special and differential treatment to, that we were required to provide that high level of medical assistance to two um, students that have some significant health needs. So they're reimbursing us the to a portion. 000. I'm not fully. I don't believe. Oh no, they are fully. It was in the agreement seventy-five thousand mm. a year. 
Okay. I'm happy to hear that. Um, so, are there questions on salaries? So, and Luann, this is a quick question. So, there is intramurals at the middle school. One is posted every two years, but then that's the budget each year. It's just a two year roll, I'm assuming. Yes, what we've asked is that we allow, you know, other people are allowed to try, you know, to get stipends for intramural or interscholastic sports. Because you see the amount of that stipend, right? It's a fair amount of money. Yeah. So, there are some people that, are, that really vie for that position. So, just you can't have it from the time you get the job in the district for 20 years. Gotcha. No, I was kind of, I was wondering about <laughs> mm -hmm. the amount. Yeah. Okay. And the schools are very good with their clubs. I mean, they look at attendance, how many kids are attending, and uh, they do a really nice job with scheduling it so different people can get different access to having clubs in that. Is the district considering uh, making Camp Duncan two days, three, three days and two nights again, no, or is uh, that no. just, or does that just need to be get updated? That just needs to. That's from the CBA when it was still that way. Yes. So that just needs okay. to be updated. So if you have other salary questions, obviously, or any questions, email me oh, and I'll hoping. respond back to the entire board. On our health insurance, so we have our insurance through Northern, uh, through Northern Illinois Health Insurance Program, so we're in a cooperative with other school districts. Um, for this year, I was very happy our PPO increase is only 1.2%, which is amazing because we've had some pretty severe years. Our HMO 6.6, .6, that's typically going to always be higher. We only have about 70 employees on HMO, so you're spreading that risk over a much smaller group. Smaller? Smaller. Our dental 1.4%, which is a great uh, improvement over where we were. So I'm very happy with the insurance um, renewals that we have for this year. Uh, compared to last year, we had much higher increases. But can you give us just kind of a snapshot say, of what of it things, is yeah. versus when we did the collective bargaining agreement three years ago? Because it's, it's not been 1.2% no, in those three years, to ballpark. I think last year it was 5% or higher for PPO. So it always we have always been much higher, 4 to 5% at least, because we have very bad experience. And the collective bargaining agreement was locked for those four years. Well, no, we, we increased, um, no, the premium increases every year, so the employee portion and the employer portion Shift. increase. So there's a percentage Basically. breakdown. Okay. So they both do share in that, that increase, obviously the board picking up majority of that increase. The share. So one of the things Luann and I talked about it after you and I had to talk about it was having the gal from the insurance company, Lisa Yevsky from Gallagher, coming out at some point as you as you gear up for negotiations just so the board especially because there's three new members has a real deep understanding of insurance because it is really complicated mm -hmm. and there's a lot of different plans that are offered and the the premiums and the, the out-of-pocket expense you know the for the board changes every year and it's a big number because you know we employ 750 people in the district so you'll just have to direct us at Luann and, and uh, you know Eric as to when you'd like to have that on the agenda for up an upcoming meeting mm -hmm. And she can come out and talk about NIHIP and kind of the components of that and how rates are calculated and everything. Is, is the board all interested in that conversation of, of having that? Because I know I am. I'd like yeah. to hear mm -hmm. that in anticipation of the collective bargaining mm -hmm. negotiations. So. It's a big chunk of the budget. It is. 30% in it's just mm -hmm. a It's huge. So it is? Maybe, maybe if we've got a hole, I know that's kind of laughable, if we have a hole in one of these agendas, over the summer. <laughs> that we is stick that in. <laughs> Yeah, I just need enough notice to get well, her. Well, right, here. right now your latest agenda is going to be July and you'll, you know, August is usually not overly crowded. I can take a peek while while Lillian keeps talking to see what okay. we have in, in draft yeah. form. So, and we try and do that in July. I mean, even if it's a half hour or 45 minutes. I can check know, with Lisa. an item on the agenda. I can text her. That's comical, right? Kind of. I just want to note that. <laughs> we all have to tape our mouths shut. We can we just Oh just Tom. <laughs> if it's in July I won't be here, so don't worry about it. Mm. No, you said you'll be here. I know. Life insurance uh, remains flat. Uh, the TRS board share that they pay on certified staff remain flat. THIS, which is the teachers' health insurance, uh, that's after they retire, remain flat. Our IMRF for 2019 and 20, respectively, uh, IMRF uh, saw quite a steep climb, um, increase, but they are looking for an overall increase uh, with IMRF. So uh, everyone in IMRF got hit this year. Is that 
because of market fluctuation, or is that because our age? Our I think it's age more. Of, I can report back. I believe it was market. We did receive information on it. No, it does not have to do with the age of our. The market's employees. been up pretty. It, well, this is the whole IMRF. It's no, not no, just I, us. I, I, so I can. I'll, br I'll bring more information. Uh, next time on what is happening with that. IMRF is fully funded, which is awesome. A nice thing. Uh, so that, you know, those are things that are beyond our control as far as what those rates are, but I was happy TRS and THIS remained the same. Our materials and services, Vanna. Um, in our curriculum uh, budget, the 2210 budget, which is a large budget, and this is overseen by Lori Lopez. Um, so I mean, this is, think of everything from art, PE, I mean, everything falls within uh, her areas. Uh, so some of her major things uh, that she wanted me to mention, uh, major ones are literacy intervention materials, response to intervention they'll be uh, purchasing this year. Uh, new adoption, they'll be setting up a committee and working on for elementary social studies. Uh, health, we now have added ex access for our middle school students for online textbooks. Middle, middle school math, integrated math materials, and then we have a new adoption for middle school social studies, uh, which she had talked with the board about. And then we are actually starting, um, this is not very exciting, but we do try to replace some of our larger assets Matt's being a big asset, uh, throughout uh, the district. So this year I have Andrew, who is our curriculum specialist, they identify like kind of where we need to start because my safety is always of my utmost uh, concern. And with the mats, we want to make sure they're in good working order. So those are kind of some of the major ones. Uh, some of the other things in her budget is, you know, she does a lot of the professional development and so we have early re you know we have release day subs that's a large part of her budget some consultants on our SEL um, and web-based programs as we had talked about last year that cost continues to increase textbook companies have learned that where we used to keep a textbook for seven years or more yeah now you get the online for three years and then they hit you with a big renewal um, so that's within her budget. So, um, I mean, great job on her budget. Yep. Okay. And I talked about that, the increase in subs. Okay, so Vanna, go to technology expenditures. Okay, so every year we have, um, this pretty much doesn't change. So we have our Chromebook and iPad uh, refresh that we do for the students. So that is uh, pretty much every year expenditure that doesn't adjust too much, and we just know it's coming. Uh, staff device refresh, uh, she's does, uh, they do like a whole building at a time, so I think field is up this year. So we have staff keeping devices like five years. So, I mean, a long enough That's a long period time of time, but the Max actually lasts pretty, pretty well. It's so. Every four years they refresh and, and they hold up, but sometimes we have to call support the cavalry yeah. to find space and you know, back things up. But it, you're right, this is a good device. It's, it's worth the money. The other thing we have in the budget this year is, and this is not necessarily new, but we are in desperate need of repair for our Lincoln and Emerson sound systems and their gyms. So we had Lincoln in last year, but we did, they didn't get to the project. Uh, she's asked me to add Emerson, so there'll be work done on their sound systems in both of the gyms. Uh, next page. So our other expenditure is our contingency, our 500000 This year, um, if you look through the budget, we kept 100000 in special ed for next year. So for, I wanted to make sure, and Leanne did too, that we have enough funds in there to cover new curriculum adoptions, which we would be talking to the board about, or other materials uh, that they need. So obviously that'll be the board's decision, but we are asking that we would leave that money in uh, special ed for one more year for the adoptions. So looking at our education fund from 1819 to 1920, uh, we have about a 2.1 percent increase. Last year we had at this time over a 4 percent increase. Um, I mean don't get like too excited because this is still 
pretty preliminary. So we have final hiring to do, um, you know, final information to receive. As you saw, those blue areas we need to work on. Uh, but right now we're looking at a 2.1% increase, and hopefully we can deliver uh, even better once we get to September. <coughs> Transportation fund this year, if you had a chance to look at that budget, um, we're up about 0.62%. Uh, this budget, obviously, the biggest uh, bill in there is for transportation of our regular students and our special ed students on a day-to-day -day basis. We have a contract with Lakeview that the board allowed us to extend last year for two years. Uh, we're seeing a 3.75% increase. Um, I will be coming back to the board probably this fall or early in the winter. This would be a normal time. We would consider going out to bid. Um, but what we, I want to talk to the board because districts are seeing like 35% increases when they're going out to bid because there's such a shortage of drivers or there's something else going on. So uh, we have districts where their own companies telling them to go out to bid, and so we know what's going to happen. They're going to end up with a huge increase. From the new gas tax. What? Are the transportation companies accept, exempted from the new gas tax? Um, I'm not sure. Let me check on that. We don't pay um, the, a lot of the taxes. No, I know we don't, but because we're going out to a private company to do the transportation, I'm wondering if they're, because they're doing it for educational purposes. We usually do it so they're not paying that part of the taxes either, but let me check okay. on that. <clears throat> so when, when is the transportation contract up? Did you say that and I missed At it? At the end of you the 2019-20 school year. Okay, so the end of that. Okay. Right. And so transportation is usually done as a competitive bid, lowest responsible bidder. But when we see what the landscape looks like as we get ready for 2021, like are we seeing a change at bus companies and that? But what I'm hearing right now from other districts is still these crazy, ridiculous increases when they're going out to bid. So we have an option to renew mm -hmm. at a right, fixed that's for, as long as another company as going out to bid and potentially rolling the dice and getting a 35 percent increase. So as long as the law is as long as like if I had another company come and say they want us to go to bid, we have to go to bid. Okay. If we don't, um, then you can reach an agreement addendum to our contract on a, a percentage increase or no increase, um, and that's how that would move forward. And what we're seeing across the industry because of the bus driver shortage is a lot of companies five years ago, six years ago, they would have been knocking on our door mm -hmm. saying, when are you going out to bid? I'm noticing it's up. They're, they're not even approaching us. Because a couple of years ago when there was a level of dissatisfaction, it was three or four years we ago. We tried. With Lakeview, we tried to go out for bid and we really didn't have anybody. Even if somebody that had been hounding both of us for yes. a number of years, yeah. we went back to him and said, hey, we, you know, we went out to bid, where were you? He's like, I couldn't take on any additional business because we have such a driver shortage. So it'll be curious to see what happens. And they are, a lot of the companies I know ours is paying at least 25 an hour for bus drivers. But it's kind of like the lunch supervisor. Think about that schedule. It's morning and afternoon. Right. If you need a regular full-time job, that's not really going to do it. And do we typically do a three-year contract with the transportation? Uh, typically when we would go out to bid, we would do a three-year contract um, with the supplier. And potentially with the clause to extend, which is what we did, right? Mm -hmm. like, do We've been... You know, we had a kind of a one rocky year with um, Lakeview, and that's when we kind of had to go out to bid discussion with them and did go out to bid. They, uh, in turn, hired two additional individuals that are uh, pretty much on the spot all the time. So, you know, once in a while we'll have a, a little hiccup. Someone will call and say, oh, they missed my stop, but it, it's become not too many, you know, the biggest complaint I get is I want my stop closer, but. We don't do door to door, so. Why not? Well, just for you. Did we skip over 27 and 28? What? Slides 27 and 28 um, in our. You talked about uh, the architect fees. Oh, did okay. So we did that. So, okay. Oh, so, you can't. Uh, are you seeing some of the slides? You weren't supposed to. Oh, okay. Because 25, you mentioned the Lincoln and Emerson was left over from last time. And then one. Because in our, in our version, we have 27 and 28, and it looks like some on. 27 might have been from I was last year with too. Your so, yeah. Okay, so just ignore 27. <laughs> Some of them I said skip, and oh, when okay. they converted it, it may not have okay. skipped. Because no, that story is for next time. Okay. Some of it. <laughs> 
Um, so our tort fund that we talked about, um, I'm very happy to say we're going down another 11% this year. We went down 13%. Um, when I came here, our workers' comp was out of control. So we have really worked with our risk company to uh, make sure that we're providing the proper training to all staff. Um, you know, obviously seriously hitting our custodians with the training uh, to reduce injuries and then working with our other staff, we do bring them in to train, um, you know, each building, usually th through a district directed Wednesday, he'll come to each building and talk to them, um, which does help. We're making sure uh, that we're maintaining our parking lots, you know, salting, plowing, you know, slips, trips, all that stuff is... Uh, where you see your expenditures start and they can just increase from there with you know liability cases and that so We really try to provide a safe of an environment in our buildings ladders the teachers have access to you know Reasonable size, so they're not standing on a chair and do we chart injury free days by school? No No We we don't um, typically like this year almost I would say 90% have been uh, student-inflicted injury to a staff member. But most of them are just, uh, we inf like we submit it no matter what because we don't know if over the weekend it's gonna turn into something. So we, we tell them we have to submit it to Workman's Comp. Um, but that's what we've seen the most of this year. I think we had a couple winter falls. Um, but it's but I get a report monthly. To a physical level. Is our largest workman's comp issue right now. Yes. Student inflicted. To an adult. Yeah. And that's not just this district. Right, it's right, right. other districts too. So I'm very happy with that, how that budget is trending. Um, so that kind of concludes the ones we were talking about tonight. I, I could talk a few more hours if you like. No. No. Please, thank you. Any, if you don't have questions right now for me, if you think of questions, or if you want to set up a time, I can meet up with two of you at a time before we have to post it. If you want to look at some things like dig deeper. Um, next time we'll be talking about the other funds, the O&M, uh, IMRF, uh, work, working cash, and our construction fund. And uh, so we'll be talking about those. And then with Leanne's presentation, kind of an update on our SPED, we'll do an update on the budget for SPED and kind of bring everyone up, up to date on where we are with their budget. Okay, questions? Any other questions from the board? It was just a comment. I do appreciate that you do zero-based budgeting. I think it's a lot of work. It is. And to start from the ground, but I think it really, you look at what expenditures need to happen rather than rolling your budget from year to year. So thank you. I appreciate that. It's effort. a lot of work starting four years ago. When she came in, that was one of the things we were really looking to, to bring to the district. So when uh, Mrs. Allard retired, you know, one of the top qualifiers was somebody that knew how to zero-base. Because Five years ago, we couldn't tell you what it costs to run all of our programs, and now anybody can ask, and we absolutely know. So it's a lot of work for Luann, her department, but certainly the, the heads of the department as well. But um, it's nice and clean for everybody to understand what it costs to offer everything that we offer. Yeah, well, I'm very happy at, to the point we are right now with how we're doing our budgeting. I had a much bigger hand this year because uh, Val's very intense with Infinite Visions right now. Um, we'll be going live July 1, so they're like ripping their hair out. And ready to kill me and but so I'm like I've always done budgeting but Brian had done a lot of it you know really hands-on which Val will be too and it was just kind of good to go back and see all the progress we've made with how they're doing their budgets yeah. I was proud of them only thing you're missing I, I ran zero base for years you don't have the boxing gloves hanging in your office so I do have a hat yeah. <laughs> I used to throw gloves at, at, at people and say, okay, fight for your peace. Here's the glove. Thanks, Luann, you're doing a great job. Thank you, thank you very much. Any other questions from the board before we move on? And we will get both of these. <clears throat> great. And you've got a couple of, you. I know you were taking notes, there yes. are a couple of homework questions. I have on questions have on okay. IMRF, the new gas tax, getting Lisa in July. So those are the top ones I have yep. right now. If you think of other ones, you can always email, text, call me, whatever. Yep, great. 
Okay, moving on to the administrative and exempt salary increase proposal. Okay. Um, five years ago, at this time five years ago, we started talking with the Board of Ed um, about how we were going to incentivize administrators and other employee groups in which we now have identified our three exempt groups. Um, the Board worked very closely with uh, Mrs. Allard and then now Mrs. Colstead and I on trying to make sure that we were bringing folks into the market competitively, that we were paying attention to the market increases by collecting data from the North Cook School District so we know what an average increase is going to be. We also know how folks are slotted within quartiles. So as they move through their career, we can kind of watch where they should be within reason um, in this area. Probably three years ago, we identified five benchmark districts that we, we mm -hmm. um, track very closely with academically as well as from a fiscal standpoint because they do, we do see them as our employment as well as our um, compensation competition. And over the last few years, we have gotten to a point with the board where um, they have such an understanding of kind of what our process is that we really come to the board with it not to exceed amount. Um, and we let you know what that percentage increase would be on an average by those that are eligible for an increase. And by that I mean we back anybody out that's new. We're not adding that 3% or 4%, whatever it might be, to folks that are, that are leaving the district. It's just a clean number. If there's 10 folks returning um, and we, we're going to give them a 7% raise, we'd say we need $70,000. <coughs> Bless you. Thank so you. tonight we're here to talk with you uh, about what it is that we're proposing um, administratively and then from an exempt category. So Lori, can you just remind me, sure. those five benchmarking districts, tell me those again, please. So we have Glenview, mm -hmm. Hinsdale, mm -hmm. when, uh, Deerfield, Deerfield Wilmette. Wilmette, and Arlington Heights. Look at that, we remembered them. <laughs> Who knew We, we use those for uh, negotiations also. Okay, it's good to know. So we are not to exceed amount for um, the 1920 school year will be $77,000, which re would represent if everybody received the same amount, a 3.3% increase. Over the past few years, we've, we've asked for a percentage increase that we then, depending on whether you're receiving a proficient um, rating or a distinguished rating, we kind of divide um, up formulaically. We've also asked the board over the last few years for a market adjustment. But because we've been so focused mm -hmm. on making sure that folks are coming into the market properly, we're paying attention to those annual increases, we're no longer at a point where we need an additional, you know, a, a Tony Varelli word, an additional bolus of money um, <laughs> to incentivize the administrators. So the amount we're asking for is, is a, a not to exceed value of 77000 for administrators. Moving on then to the next category of employees, and we've talked with the board over the last few years um, as we've come out of each new collective bargaining, collective bargaining agreement. Um, any group of exempt employees, we've tried to figure out which uh, bargaining group does it make the most sense for them to track closest to. So in Group A, we have seven employees uh, that include building technologists. Um, group A will track with the PRTAA, and for the new board members, that's our teachers union, which would be a 3.10% increase for the 1920 uh, school year. Group B, in which has, there are 23 employees, they include our occupational therapists and our physical therapists, our registered nurse, and a few other key exempt employees that we really consider to be performing um, high levels of work. They're licensed. Um, and they're, they're very skilled individuals. They're tracking with our teachers, who uh, you heard Louanne say earlier, are, are at a 3.3% average increase for the 1920 school year. Our last group, Group C, <coughs> pardon me, has four employees, um, and it includes individuals who support substantive, who provide substantive support to administrators. Um, most staff members have advanced degrees, many years of experience in their specific field, and they really do help us work um, administratively to a higher level. We kind of see them as quasi-administrators. Uh, Bernadette Tram, Brian Imhoff, who's now, you know, Valerie. Uh, Ron. Um, Ron DeGeorge. So that, that those four members, um, those are three. Who else? We're missing one. I'll think of it. Bernadette, Ron, Val, somebody else. I'll think of There's it. There's four of them. It'll come to us. And these are all individuals that typically have other individuals reporting to mm -hmm. them, too. And they're tracking it. Oh, is it Carrie? No, she's I. No, her. I'll have to think about it. And, but that group we also have tracking with the PREA, which is our teachers' union. Okay. And that, not to exceed dollar value, would be $61,000 for the upcoming year. We did, as we uh, were asked to do in years past, break these into two different motions in the event you wanted to say yes to one and 
or no to another or, or whatnot. So um, we'll entertain questions and then we'll we'll seek approval. How how much uh, or refresh my memory? Last year's not to exceed number. Last year's right not to exceed same, not to exceed number. I think it was around. I think it was around the same number. Yeah. And then we had a, a market adjustment. Seventy-five for administrators. administrators. And how much was it for exempt employees, or was it all one number? No, no, no. No, we had two separate. Because you actually took action at two separate meetings last year. Last year was the first year we broke them out separately. Can you find that spreadsheet? Well, it says Group A is eight yeah, six nine one. Group B was thirty-five thousand. Group C was seventeen thousand. Look at so you. Got it all there. Three of those. We have that spreadsheet. I'll tell you. What was it? What was it? Sixty grand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So just so we can tee this up too, because I know it was discussed at the meeting. I was not at on April twenty second, but the other piece of this is that um, to use the new phrase instead of the bolus of money, Larry's bag o' cash that bag he, cash. he referred to, okay. um, that as a result of the new rubrics that have been put in place. Um, for evaluating each mm -hmm. of these people. It is not simply a, the superintendent gets to decide arbitrarily at their discretion where this money goes, but it's based upon the rubrics that were set out. So it's performance based, it's merit based for these people and in each of these. So, so that was actually my question. Could you explain that? Because that was new last year and so we didn't have that much info and then there's that outside consultant who helps. So last year, um, yeah, it was actually a couple of years that folks on the board were asking about a merit increase. You know that we finally said, okay, you're not going to not you're not going to stop asking us. We are going to go merit based, and you know we felt that administratively that there are pros and cons to doing that, and linking compensation and, and rating and making sure you're eliminating as much objectivity mm -hmm. as possible and or eliminating as much subjectivity as possible and trying to make the rubrics as objective, uh, you know, as we can. We worked for almost an entire year to create rubrics for every job classification at the ESC administratively, and then for these uh, all the different exempt employees, in which you saw in parens how many different potential rubrics. rubrics you're writing. So it was an extensive project, and this will be the first year, at the, at the end of this month, really, we will have figured out everybody's level, whether they're proficient, distinguished, unsatisfactory or needs improvement and then we will sign raises accordingly. The numbers which why they're rated or why they're listed here is not to exceed is because we haven't finished rating everybody moving through that evaluation process. So if everybody sees the average amount it would, it would be you know that dollar value. So, I mean, so what's happened historically is I've come mm -hmm. in under under value. Yes. I was just going to ask that question. So the last 2 years because this has been this is I think going to be third year 3 that we're doing this. Mm -hmm. Have you, you have you used all the not to exceed funds, or have you fallen I have, under? She's it? never used all of them. But. So the the one thing just about the rubrics. So we worked with Dr. Cynthia Heidorn. She's a retired superintendent. Um, she does a lot of uh, group work with teams. Um, I mean, she's just a super wealth of knowledge. She actually worked with us on developing the rubrics. So we provided, you know, job descriptions and a lot of feedback and conversation. And what it really does, when I looked at one of my exempt employees uh, rubric, is it really shows the employee the difference between proficient and excellent. This right? Thing. Excellent is really stepping outside the box and, you know, going that extra dis distance. I'm not just doing my job. Right, I'm looking for new ways to improve it and et cetera. So I, I really like how the tool turned out. And they're all different. So um, it's not just one tool. Mine is different from Joel's. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, based on the job description. And can you remind and Eric, us? Make sure you give yourself two months to finish them. Because they're like, write that down. Pages. Two months. <laughs> two months. Can, can you remind us? Uh, can you remind us what was put in, what was put in place to prevent or to avoid? one person from getting all $77,000? Well, you have checks. I mean, you have me here, too. Right. There's <laughs> like, nothing. Not and Joel. Really, technically speaking. So it's, it's three years now that I'm asking this question. Is So we, just, I'm, just for the benefit of everyone else here, it's an average of 3.38% mm -hmm. or 2 point. Someone might get a 12% raise if someone feels no. they deserve it. I'm not saying yeah. that you've ever done that historically, but our superintendent, this one and our future one, has the 
authority to do so without coming, once we approve this not to exceed $77,000 number, without coming back to us, whoever is giving these funds. Now, I'm not saying they would do that because then when they come back the, the following year, they're going to have if some issues. If I recall, issues. when we had the knockdown drag them out over this whole thing last year, whenever it was, we talked about tying the rubrics <laughs> to a matrix, say. which says, for instance, if you, if you yes, hit so category much. A, you're getting a 3.38% increase. That's if right. it was category B, you're getting a 3.1. If it's we're doing it, and that's insane. exactly what we did. So you so can't go about that yeah. because you're stuck <coughs> by the matrix. Right. And that's what I was going to say to Tom. We said so that last year. PREA, the 3.38% would be if you're distinguished. The 2.38 or thereabouts yes. would be if you're proficient. Which is why I posed the question as to what did we put in place to but avoid that. So that is, a, that, that is a recommendation. That is not some, that, that matrix that you're talking about. Is a recommendation. You're not the whoever is has the authority. We're giving the authority. If I recall correctly, please correct me if I'm wrong. You're not. But I, I, I remember. Wrong. Wrong. I remember that that's the recommendation and that's the best practice. However, there's nothing in what we've discussed over the last three years while we've been discussing this that would prevent anybody from giving somebody a seventy-seven thousand dollars raise because tomorrow morning. Because it's at morning. the discretion of the superintendent. Correct. That's what you're driving at. So I just, want, I just I wanted remember, that to be clear but, for but everybody. But remember, our salaries are all public too. Right. So. No, right. I'm not saying it would happen. I just want everyone. To, there's and new people at the table. So. Because also this was part of this, as I recall, the conversation <laughs> at the time was including market adjustments. Right. So it wasn't just you might have had a person who got only a two percent raise, let's say, because they hit here on the, on the matrix, but they were getting a five thousand dollar market adjustment. That's a bad example. Yes, maybe, they, yes. maybe they were higher up on the matrix, but they were also getting a five thousand dollar market adjustment. Right? Mm -hmm. That yes. that could have happened. Now we're fairly well caught up mm -hmm. with market adjustments. That it's no longer an issue. Because I agree when with I, you, right, when I looked at our administrative pools, we had a handful that we were really focused on trying to make sure. And because, we did it over a number of years. Right, well, you know, prior to my arrival, it was you throw a dart. Just wherever so, they land, it, there was no rhyme or reason to who was paid to, at what level. So based I'd, on I'd, experience I'd like for this board to consider the next time we do this next year. Uh, that since we by then should be fully caught up on market adjustments mm -hmm. uh, with all the tricklers, we, we're pretty much already there, there now. We give ourselves one year to really get there. That we do put a cap, the same way that that there's a cap for PREA, there's a cap for PRTA, there's a cap for everybody. We do put a cap on this as well, and that way, you know, mm -hmm. we can mm -hmm. have a little more more control over how those. You funds and I are talked about that. I know I talked with Joel about it, and you and we, we had a conversation, sidebarring. When we started with our, our bargaining units, we talked about a floor and a ceiling for those of you that were on the board when we were negotiating with those three unions over the last three years, four years. We talked about a floor and a ceiling, and we talked about the role that CPI would play. And when CPI is fairly healthy, like it is right now at a 2.1, it's different than when CPI is below a percentage point, right. which right. is why you would need a floor. And then, you know, we've told the teachers when CPI is, is, is pretty healthy, you can enjoy that benefit. But when CPI, when we're struggling, because we don't have a lot of new revenue coming into the district, then we have to tighten the belt. But then I, I did say to Rick, it's kind of you know, like parting thoughts, you probably want to have a conversation about do you want to cap at any point where we track? Because again, with our teachers especially, when we stretched that salary schedule and really looked at the percentages behind the cells, you know, we found some large, mm -hmm. large percentages that through the stretching, which means it takes six years more to get to the bottom, that real expensive area when you go your degrees and your years down here. So I always kind of do that motion. And looking at the percentage points behind those cells, we've thin, mm -hmm. thinned them out quite a bit. They were at 6%, 7%, 8%. Oh God, yeah. We've kind of tried to standardize that over collective bargaining, but how high do you want to go? Well, and I think the other thing group? that Lori's done, we've done when she's, we've been cognizant of the 3% or the 6%. So I can tell you that no administrator ever got 6% mm -mm. Right. ever. So how about if we do this? We have to make a motion too so that we can further discuss this, I think, but what about the idea, I mean, I know where Tom is going with this and I know we talked about this before. Ultimately, it's the board's job to hold the superintendent accountable mm -hmm. and if you or her goes off the rails on that and gives somebody a $70,000 raise, frankly, that's our fault as much as it is the mm -hmm. superintendent's fault because we should be holding you accountable for that. So could we get simply a report sure. of what the salary increases were after you've made the decision as to what they are. The we total dollar value? No, 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 just the, just the spreadsheet of 
this person got 1,200, this person got 1,400, yep. this person, I don't even care if the names are on there, it doesn't matter. Yeah, and we, if, we if have we that, see, we, we can do that for yeah. the 24th. Yeah, for the board, we so have that, that because it's public anyway. Zero um, out. Yep. And that way we can look at it. If we see something there that's off kilter, we can at least call it to your attention yep. right on the spot. As do you want the dollar to, amount or the percentage? I would think the percentage is more useful. But it's, right, because you know, we're looking at we're evens everything out. We're reporting to yeah, you. If somebody said they got an eight percent, and everybody yeah. else got three. I think it's easy to see yeah. that. We share that because we can. Yeah. That's easy. That's yeah. easy. Yeah. We, okay. we, that's how we calculated it. So that's easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll you put could it on for the twenty-four. Also, change your motion tonight with a, like not to exceed six percent or something. I mean, because that's how we've been operating anyway. Well, especially because when we did this, we were under a three percent cap, but. Yeah. Our six percent cap. I don't know that that's. But I mean, just, the name of the you know, or we I mean, can I look at it next year. But you could make the change tonight too. So how would we do that? We would camp it at. Bernadette, wouldn't they just change the action item? They have to change the no, language. No, no, I, I get but procedurally. No, she that knows that. that. It, oh, he's oh. talking about the the percentage. What would the? Yeah, what would the what percentage? But be? without that doc in front of me. I'm if you're saying right that now. you want to make sure someone's not receiving an excessive raise, what what well, I guess we've theoretically under, it's it, the, the camp it's it's the camp. The so for each one of these groups, for instance, Group A on the exempt, no one can receive more than a, a 3.1, right? That's according to our report. Assuming there's no uh, there's no more market adjustment stragglers left over. Yeah, I would I, I would you, agree with you 100%, from, Rick. From looking at my my spreadsheet cuz we, you know, that's how we do the math. She forces me to use Excel. <laughs> my will. Um, there's everybody there's one person that's at 4%, everybody else is at 3.38 or below. Okay, so I don't think we can do that tonight because I think that's going to mess up what you've got in there. I think we need to stick with the well, no, but what I'm saying is you could say that no raise would exceed 6%. Or even 4%. Because her and I, I mean, we've oh, never... Oh, 6% was yeah. an arbitrary number that... Well, 6% was... is what TRS has, and so that's, like, for anyone, we don't ever buy or F or TRS. But exceeded. by doing that, then it potentially opens the the, can, the, the bag of cash to be something bigger. Yeah, bag if, we, cash. if we say 6%, the bag of cash could be no, 200 grand. No, not to exceed 77. So if they, if they, gave, if they gave someone 6%, then they would have to give somebody nothing okay, so, so that they could say, balance back out both to both that 77. Yes, absolutely. Yes, she would do both. No, no, absolutely. The, the, the yeah. cap would always stay. Right. And then there would be a secondary cap as to how much one individual can actually uh, access of that 77,000. Well, and I think it's... Not that we don't already do it in practice, but right. it's wise to have it. Sure. I mean, we already do it. That we do yeah, we do it. That's how we operate. But yeah, it I, sounds like it's happening anyway. Yeah. So it I has been for the last deal. four years. Okay, so both of them would be six percent. Yeah. So not, not, not each. I don't mean to belabor the point, but why not maintain the level that they were based on in the first place? The three point three eight, the three point one zero. What would be the reasoning to go to the six percent if there's? I mean, she just said that well, someone's getting four, over four, four. or four. So if it's, I mean, if we're talking about one, two, or up to like five people, that, I mean, we can always ask for. We can always ask for an exemption. Well, that's why I said four. Because looking at my spreadsheet, yeah, we don't person really that go like over just that. Just kind of lagging a little so bit, and is I, this exempt and and not? So this, my first, I have yes. administrators up, but exempt are the same. So yeah. we can say that you know, for five people. The, the well, cap is that, six. You can just say the cap. To, not to exceed 4%. Not to exceed 4%. This is already baked into their con. You know, like this is like, we're not going to change this. The numbers are, we need this amount. We've assigned it. Once you approve it, it's going to payroll. And they're going to start getting ready for the July payroll. Right. So, all right. So why, why don't we do this? Why don't we make the motion? We can talk more if there's anything to talk about after the motion's been made and seconded, if it's seconded. Um, so just so whoever's going to read this right now, I think it would read something to the effect of approve and not to exceed dollar value of $77,000 and not to exceed 4% for any one individual raise mm -hmm. for, you know, for blah, 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 mm -hmm. whatever it is. Okay. So I will entertain uh, a motion on the administrator raises right now. I move that the Board of Education of Community <coughs> Consolidated School District 64, Park Ridge, Niles, Illinois, approve a not to exceed dollar value of 77,000 for administrator raises and 4% for individual raises. Mm -hmm. Not to exceed. Not to exceed. Yes, that's mm -hmm. exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> Do I have a second on that? Second. Rebecca's got the second. 
<coughs> any discussion on that item for administrator raise? So we mentioned July 1st. That's the, the effective date is going to be July 1st. Yep. Should we include Our that? Our calories run July 1st. Right. Okay, no. so that's fine. So I just have one last. With only one person in question, I don't see a reason why we should veer off of what we do for our other employees in this district by increasing it to 4%. I think we should cap it at the 3.38, at the 3.1, and then just give exemption of one employee to go to 4%. Well, well the teachers and everyone else all receive a different raise based on where they are on the Through salary the schedule. So agreement. some people are getting five and a half, some are getting so three. I mean, right. it's not a hard 3.38. It's a but that's based on that's based on that's their based that's based on step, step and lane. Down. That's not right. that's not based on on arbitrary you know right. uh, merit based. It's, it's based on it's based on a specific step and lane, and this is how you get it. And there's we can actually matrix it and know exactly what it is and why they're getting it. It's really step, not even lane. It's nothing to do with okay. their education. Right. We don't look at that. Right. From which, one year to the next. Which is why I think we're unless we want to push this off, which I don't think you can, because then you're pushing off the increases for another month. We do it the other way, which is get the report, hold her and him accountable for that report. If we see something off base on there, we call it to their attention right away. But I think we're, we're past the point at which we can really adjust this the way we want to adjust. And I think your point earlier was we do it for next year. We, next year, we actually tie it specifically in the matrix to those numbers, and it doesn't exceed that number. The only way you exceed that if, if, if A is 3.38, and the only way you exceed it is with some sort of discretionary thing from the superintendent right. for a market adjustment. And you know, honestly, we've gone round and round, and I still don't necessarily agree at all that it's. I, don't, I struggle to know if you're in the weeds at this point in time. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, um, in terms of this, because you're approving a, an amount of money that I'm going to assign based on my evaluation of my employees. You evaluate the superintendent. I evaluate my mm -hmm. team. Right. But we may very well be in the weeds, but so I'm just we're trying legally, to figure out the right. I know we're legally entitled to be in the weeds, but more importantly, if we get the report and we see line item by line item, we can hold you accountable to that. I agree with you that, that it's it's ultimately your call, but it's also our call to hold you accountable or Eric accountable for it. And if we see the report, it's in black and white. There's mm -hmm. no there's no way to to hide it. In the past, the board wasn't getting a report. Mm -hmm. The board had no clue. You had seventy-seven thousand dollars, and you got to decide if you wanted to give one person seventy-six thousand nine hundred, and some, and everybody else a hundred bucks. That now we're changing right. it so that the superintendent is truly accountable to the board, and the board gets to see that data. And without That's all we're asking. and without without giving certain direction to our superintendent, how can you then negatively evaluate them after the fact if you didn't tell them what you expected in the first place? So if we didn't have this conversation, and a superintendent gave. Twenty thousand dollars to one person, and I couldn't then a year, you know, at your at, at the superintendent's evaluation say, "How dare you do that? I'm going to give you a bad evaluation." When you, you can you can maybe justify it, but without knowing what the board's expectations are, now I think the expectations of the board are pretty clear that we don't really now that market adjustments have been pretty much done away with, mm -hmm. we don't believe, or at least I think we're all agreeing that we don't believe any one person should receive. And anything beyond a specific number. Because over the last few years, we have worked towards giving you a percentage that tracks with the teachers. So it's not, it's never been an arbitrary thing. If it goes beyond that mm -hmm. percentage, we've asked for market adjustment funds. And I think that's potentially mm -hmm. what you haven't, right. we are looking for clarity on. We're not doing market adjustments this year because we've spent the last three putting people into mm -hmm. the right lane, so to speak. Administratively. Well, which is why I don't, uh, that's why I recommended that we stick to the 3.38, right. 3.10, and then if you do need to adjust one market. person, you ask for a market adjustment for that one person, beyond not that. beyond that 3.38. That's why I, I brought it back up again, because there's no reason, I don't see a reason to go to 4% or 6% when we've already identified that there's only really one or two people we're talking about. If that's the case, mm -hmm. come back for a market adjustment on those two people. We agree on those two people getting a market adjustment, and we move on. At least we've solidified that no one gets more than than 3.38 or whatever. Okay. So, are you suggesting we amend the motion to cap it? At, well, <laughs> the way it's presented the first to us. One I mean, it's 3.38, right? For, for yep. administrators, it would be 3.38. Right. And I do see this is in the weeds. I think the seventy-seven thousand we are on our you know board is fiscal oversight. 
And so when we're at that level of 77,000, then what an individual, um, the superintendent hires the folks ultimately in the district. And so he or she, I think, and you know, in three point in education, if it's three point three percent or three point one percent, it's it's like <laughs> very little cash, you know. So I'd be like, whatever happens when I was evaluated, but I think we're overseeing the seventy seven thousand. That's just my. And I, I would say that's probably what we've discussed over the last couple of years. But if yeah, you you tell me or tell her for the future. All right, so right now the motion that's on the table is for a not to exceed 4% raise with, again, is the under, un, unsaid part of that, which is that we would get a report with whatever the breakdown is after the fact. So that's the motion that's on the table right now. And, yeah, and preferably what percentage and dollar amount, because I think there's a discussion about that. So I think it would just be easier just to do yeah. percentage and dollar amount. Just type in exempt. Yep. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even have to have the names. Have I mean, Google not that it's all public information right. anyway. But well, I was, I was going to say this information is listed on our website in terms of who makes what. Right. So it's all public. Find it. Yep. And I don't even need the report. I mean, I trust that Luann and Lori are are making ethical decisions with their. Um, but I think it's if that's going to make everyone feel better. It's just to save the legwork of us having to, you know, like pull them all out well, and do a new spreadsheet. It's, it's to hold yeah. superintendents and, and that accountable too, yeah. and not have what happened in Lincoln Way where a superintendent yeah. got indicted. Um, and then that person who was the board president comes and lectures this board on board governance. Yeah. So I think that's what it's about. <coughs> okay, we got a motion. Yes, we do. Yep. We got 4% tied to it. It's time to take a vote. Agreed. Okay. Any other discussion? Is that, you're talking about the exempt? Where are we? Because we've, Denise moved it, Rebecca seconded it. Yep, so we are at, the, again, just to clarify, the motion right. is not to exceed 77,000, <laughs> this is administrators, not to exceed $77,000, not to exceed 4% for any one individual Division. raise, and we're gonna get a report, a breakdown of what those things are. Okay, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yep, call the question. Sure. Um, so I have my randomizer again. Thank you, Bernadette. Pick a number. Oh, really? Right, so I'll pick so cute. the number. Just oh, pick a random number. Three. One through fourteen. Three. three. Okay. Uh, Riles. Yes. Sanchez. Yes. Pearl. Yes. Biaggi. Yes. Salas. Yes. Little. Yes. Sotos. No. <clears throat> okay. Motion passes. Uh, <coughs> next motion is for the exempt employee raises. Someone be kind enough to make that. <laughs> And because, I think, just so we're clear, we, been asking to cap it four percent is what we should stick to on this year, one we as well. Done it easily. Yes. Three point eight three percent to okay. keep four percent. I did. I said three times. Who would like to make that motion? I said three times. I move that the Board of Education of Community Consolidated School District sixty four Parkers Niles Illinois approve a not to exceed dollar value of sixty one thousand dollars, and not to exceed four percent for any individual raise for exempt employee raises. I have a second? Second. Larry's got the second. Any discussion on this one now? 4% is the accurate number for Nick, this as well too? You need to type that in. I've been trying to tell you that. I've typed in the admin one. Figure out where the exempt is. I have it. I need to make sure to your, because we didn't know this was coming, so we're. Yeah. There's nobody exceeding it. Just wanted to make sure. Nobody exceeding four? No. In this pool. Okay. Okay. So then you don't even need that. So you can do whatever. Oh, there was nobody exceeding. There's nobody exceeding well, four. It's it's in there add now. Four? <laughs> There's no one at four right now. No. Okay, so well, then you don't need. That's why I'm trying already, to get clarity on. It's already in the motion. Unless, okay. unless mm -hmm. someone wants, unless we want to redo it. But what do you mean? It's there. Four percent is the cap. Any discussion on this motion? Well, to clarify, this, this, uh, you're, you're, Luann, you're saying that there's no one that's, that, that, that there, there's no one that you gave 4%, 4 to. Is, is there anyone you gave? We're, we're on, uh, exempt. Exempt. 3.1. Did you pass 3.1? Did you pass 3.1 on the exempt? Or 3.38? Uh, there will be some 3.38s. Anything, no anything above 3.38? No. 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 Okay. That's no, I'm looking at it. Okay. Right. That's all. Yeah. Right. So I can vote yes on this one. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions on this motion? Okay, call the questions. Please. Okay, uh, Little. Yes. Sanchez. Yes. Pearl. Yes. Riles. Yes. Dallas. Yes. Sotos. Yes. Biaggi. Yes. Okay, that motion passes as well. 
All right, we are on to the personnel, personnel report. I did put a revised copy of the personnel report at your table. This time of year, we're continuing to hire people, and as soon as background checks come through, we pop them on the personnel report. So just expect in July and potentially even at the August meeting that you'll receive um, a revised personnel report again because as these background checks come through, we never know the timing. Um, we try to keep this document as updated as we possibly can. Questions yeah, on yeah, it? I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, we have uh, three nurses for summer school at Roosevelt. Uh, are, they, are they rotating, working different days? Different days of the week and different ro locations. So uh, Margaret Tamari is the district nurse, right. so she's one of them. She'll be based out of there because remember some of the schools are under construction mm -hmm. and, and then she'll rotate through the different sites. Uh, Sue will be the primary nurse at Roosevelt. And then I didn't think there was anybody else. Yeah, oh, there's. and Cher, uh, Mrs. Waddell. So they'll alternate their days. Same thing with Emerson. Patty. I, I think mean, there's Paul their job there. sharing. I know Keta for sure is job sharing. She was talking to us about that a few weeks ago. And Paula, they're gonna each take a couple days a week of summer school and just share the share the responsibility. You can notice by their salaries are kind of cut in half that they're that they're share that they're job sharing with somebody. Do you mind just pointing out what the changes were from the one we had in our report? If sure. There, if there's anything significant. So I know uh, Joel tried to bold anything that oh, was, was that it. That was was that it? it. Okay. And I, I asked him the same question. So for example, if you go down to cell five, uh, Pamela yep. through Sherry, we moved them. The rationale was we moved them from hourly to salary. Yep. Hourly, we really uh, assigned a dollar value if they need to work less than the full hours of wow. So they're only going to work maybe an hour a day or two hours a day. Salary is if they work the full yeah. the full window within WOW. So uh, Sue Wan, as she's tightening up who can work and when they can work, uh, gave that information to us today. If you go down towards uh, the, the second to the last cell on the first page, Paula Yurkovic, um, we didn't factor in when we initially put her contract amount in the amount of hours that she gets to prep for that job. So that represented a change in her her salary. Um, those that are marked new yep, were the new, new hires, yep. where the, the um, background fingerprinting and whatnot, background checks were coming through. And I think that's it. The remaining were just new, new hires that we were able to finalize. Teaching assistants for summer school, are we hiring college students? Some are recent graduates mm -hmm. if they have their certificates and their licensure, yes, they can work. Uh, we have a couple of new grads, and and they are always looking to teach summer school for the nice resume builder. They get some experience. Well, they're working as a classroom. teacher assistant. And then they're working yeah. as assistants, yep. Well, I don't know if we have more questions on the report. Why don't we do that during the motion? So someone can make the motion on it. I move that the Board of Education of Community Consolidated School District 64, Park Ridge, Niles, Illinois, approve the personnel report noting that the personnel report is based on the recommendation of the superintendent and not upon the board's direct knowledge regarding any of the specific individuals selected for employment. Do I have a second? Second. Brett has the second. Okay, any discussion, further discussion on the personnel report? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Pearl? Yes. Sotos? Yes. Little? Yes. Sanchez? Yes. Salas? Yes. Biagi? Yes. Riles? Yes. Wonderful. Wow. We are at 844. This is an absolute. <laughs> well, we only did a portion of your, I mean, a very small portion of your budget. Well, this was the big part, though. Good. This is still a miracle. All right, so next this meeting of the board is June 24th. Um, and it will be at 7 o'clock. We don't anticipate an additional closed session at this point. I do. Maybe. Perhaps. Possibly. <laughs> we I had will not a be situation here. on the last day of school that we're we're working through right now with a family with legal special education situation we may be coming to the board with that one for enclosed okay mr. mr president before you hang before you uh close this meeting i i during when we were discussing construction i completely it completely stripped, slipped my mind to ask a question we're, we're done with the field uh, uh, with what we needed to do with the city, right? That's so correct. we're getting ready to move forward. We're we're going to start uh, start doing whatever we need to do mm -hmm. to get that school ready for the next school yes. year. If you can just refresh my memory, because I, I forgot the old office 
Are we getting one large and one small classroom out of there, or just one large? So what it is is there was there's a large space there, and then there was a small room next to it. Right. But I think what the confusion that happened last week was when we initially were looking at it with the school, we had showed different renditions. So one had three smaller class sizes, right? So we were looking at different combinations of how we could do it. And I had recommended that since we need regular size classrooms, that we combine two of those into a regular size classroom and that the other one be, it's a larger group, small group room than it used to be. Is that? That was a recommendation say. way back then. You didn't just make that recommendation recently. No, that no, was no, way no. Back then. Yes, no. The so, final recommendation that was brought to the board is the one that we're building. Which is one larger, roughly 800 square foot classroom and that a, matches the other classrooms of field and a smaller like 300, 500, I don't know, three to 500 space for small group instruction or an itinerant teacher. And that's still the plan moving forward. Yes, and that has okay. not changed. All right, thank you. May I ask a clarifier on our policy on public comment? Mm -hmm. I know that was talked about. So at the last meeting, um, I, as I watched the video, I thought you did a nice job on teeing up, you know, public comments and and how, what would it be structured like. And then I just was confused, and so this might be my newness. Then there was the Washington space issue, and then there was the committee brought up during public comment, and it was very conversational, hours of conversational. Mm -hmm. And so I was confused that, and then the next individual came up, and there was conversation again. So if I just think we need to be consistent on our policy, if the policy is no interaction, and no discussion, then I think we need to do that consistently because it sets a kind of a haves and have nots. Who gets a conversational and who doesn't get any response? And I just think we need to be equitable as a board on who talks, issues. And so I just, like I said, I wasn't in the room, but when you look at things a a after the fact, you see it differently. So can, can you help me out with that, Rick? Yeah, I think you're right. That is the... Um that's the goal. I think we also said that there's going to be some times when we had a woman who was flat out yelling at, at all seven of us, all of us around this horseshoe. Yeah, that's right. um, and I think she deserved a response from the board at the time. And I think the board agreed that night that if a response would to be given during the board meeting, it would be from the board president and not from if, if the person at the podium says, Mr. Riles, why did you do you know A, B, and C? Mr. Riles doesn't respond. It's the board president that either responds or doesn't respond to that question. But it's on a discretionary basis, and I agree. There were a couple of people who were pretty heated that night. I can't. I can't remember. Did I talk to anybody that night? Did I respond I to anybody at the podium? Yep. I don't remember. I can't remember. But I think so, Denise. Would your suggestion be to wait until the person sits down, or their three minutes is up, and then address the issue? Would that be no? I just think or? I think we need to be so looking. Like I said, look, I wasn't in the room, but looking back at it, I didn't see consistency. And I think as we get seated and we get our policies, like how do we be consistent on that? So, That's are you talking about just the people at the podium, or were you talking about the panel as well? I think well, because the panel was not well, the panel, the, the was, panel not was not part of public, public comment. Public. I mean, yeah. even though it was seated at the roughly around the same time. The panel was here to have a dialogue with us, I think. Right. it wasn't. They weren't here just to give us their opinion and walk away. Right. We needed to ask some questions and get some, yeah. some response like a, from them just like and not bounce back and forth. Yeah. So putting that aside, I got to go back and watch the video because I don't remember what happened at the podium. No, you're right. It was, like, it was both, actually. You had a dialogue that we fully expected to happen, as you said, with the committee. Right. That's why we brought them in at night, and they spent two to three hours here. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was the folks from the podium, and, and there were a couple. Were those folks early. were those folks from the podium right. coming up as we were having the conversation yeah. with the, the with the panel? Right, yeah. that was yeah. one of them. Right, the woman who interacted with the board was talking about re registration and when we would find out about when bubbles burst and and, and that was happening during our conversation with the panel, right? It was kind so. of like all. It was kind of I all. I think it was after. It was like, all starting to like. I think they were Right, it was all starting to like inner, like mingle with itself. And then there were people yelling, say, no, wrong, that's not in right information. And so, I mean, it's, I don't know. Before, before, before we go, I want to. I thought it was a good meeting, though. Make a, a comment that uh, I agree with, with Denise. But the, uh, the Committee on Space at Washington 
they all need to be at the board meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened in the previous board meeting, and the reason I made a comment about SPAD and stakeholders, is because we, we've had long, arduous discussions on making sure that SPED parents are stakeholders. And then we have SPED parents who were a part of that committee, and we had the committee seated here, and none of the SPED parents, I, I'm sure they supported what the teachers brought, but we had SPED parents who got up and spoke that weren't a part of that committee that attacked this board, and then the SPED parents that were a part of the committee didn't speak. They either weren't here or they sat in the audience and they didn't speak. And <clears throat> the role of a stakeholder, if you supported the teachers that were sitting here, then your role is to get up and, and why you supported them. You're a SPED parent, all SPED parents are equal. And um, so I would just like to ensure that we have all of the stakeholders, all of the pieces of that committee here at the next board meeting. Well, I mean, we can certainly invite them. Sometimes their schedules don't uh, allow them to come, but you do have board, repre board representatives that are there. You have several administrators that were there and are sure. present and the architects. Right. So You're we right. can carry those voices through right. and help them understand right. how a decision was reached. And I think at the last, at that yeah. last committee meeting, I specifically asked the teachers to be there because to me, right. again, my opinion was the critical component in that whole conversation was what the teachers, the, the deal that they had brought sure. to the table, right. and I wanted them to present it to the board and not me present it to the board. I wanted right. you guys all to hear it from their mouths. My, my um, point but being, I agree. Yeah, my, my point <laughs> being is that all of the SPED parents need to understand that there were SPED parents as a part of that right. committee, right. and right. this group was representing the committee. Yep. Mm -hmm. and yep. they, they had not left SPED parents out. No. No. So the SPED parents came to the podium and, you know, slapped us around the room. And and after the board changed the mind and didn't and change the space. Yep. yep. All, right. All right. One more new person question, and then I think I'll be done. But um, and Rick, I do appreciate. I think you um, are a fan of transparency, particularly with the public, and so I've gathered that about you. And I just wonder, um, you are the communicator for the board, right? You're as the board president. So is there any, and you respond for the board, right? You respond on half of the board, and I think that's your role. Is there any time, or how, when do you share with us, like, Rick responded to the board this, and I'm like, okay, I mean, I'd love to know what that is if you're responding for me. Right. So is there, you know, like a four-year request? Do you synthesize, you know, here's some of the emails, here's some of the responses? I just wonder what that transparency looks like from a we president can. perspective. I think there's been a total of, since I've been board president, couple. two emails that have come to me that have mm -hmm. all gone to you. Um, so what typically Dr. Burley would do in the past, and John Heidi prior to Dr. Burley being the superintendent uh, during my tenure, was he would just copy the board as an FYI. Yeah. So uh, Tony Louisi gave Rick uh, a standard message that shoots out when someone sends him an email, and it says, hey, I may not get back to you right away. Nicely written, Tony Louisi pulled it from another um, school district. Then when Dr. Borelli would respond, he would usually CC the board knowing that it was just an FYI, so you would know what was communicated. My worry about CCing is the it, board at the time that it's yep. live is that we get into an IOMA violation yep. because if somebody anybody decides, responds. Yeah, if anybody responds, we're off the reservation at that point. So I like the idea of an after the fact. Yeah, I think you if know, you can just, you know, here's the here's three the, emails that came in, here right. was the response. Yeah. I just feel yeah. like keep us yeah. in the that's loop. And, yep. and that's us. Say, yeah. You being transparent with us, yeah, I yeah. think. So if an email Eric, comes, for, well, if an email, second, for Eric, for you as well too, as we go forward, just okay. you only have a couple more weeks of this with me, but I'm always copying you uh, yep. on the response. So I would always be doing the same thing with you. Maybe we can figure out a way to pull those together at the end of the month, present them to the board at the next meeting. However we, however we do it. The emails that come directly to you or to the district. I'm okay getting them at a later time, your responses at a later time. If an email is shot out to all of us, Absolutely. I'd like to yep. know that one a little sooner, so that way if I get caught out in public or something, I sure. can be like, hey, That's you fair. know, Rick responded, you know, that was a great response, you know, keep, you know, keep, yep. keep your dialogue with him, that's all good. Right. So at least I want to know that there was a response here, so I'm not sitting there going, well, yep. sorry I didn't respond yep. to you. And the only difference I would say there is sometimes I may not know 
that everybody's been contacted because sometimes the person will do it blind CC blind CC or one two three four so I don't know so it's a little harder so I guess the only thing I would say in that situation is um, maybe if it's if I don't know that somebody gives me a heads up that Mrs. Smith contacted all of us because I won't see that necessarily mm -hmm. Uh, and at least again, the two I've gotten yeah, so if far. I, if I don't, if I if I get an email and I don't receive something from you in like seventy two hours, I'll shoot out an email yeah. and say, "Hey, did you respond to this? Because yeah. I got yeah. CC'd on it." Yeah. I think the two I've received so far were only yeah. to me. That's correct. So that's best correct. I can tell. Yeah, I haven't received one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Yep. Okay. Any other no. new business or any other comments before we adjourn? All right. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. New, new record.